Thank you. So I'll, I realize there's uh, participants <coughs> from lots of different places, uh, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe entirely from Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to use I, what I hope is a PDF that all of you have, like slides printed or available to you, but I'll talk through each slide pretty slowly um, so that even if you don't have the slides, it'll make sense. Um, and, this morning, and then I'll answer any questions uh, that anyone has uh, at the end of this, I hope, pretty fairly brief uh, presentation. And what we're doing this morning is talking about antibody-mediated prevention of uh, acquisition or transmission of HIV, acquisition of HIV. Uh, and that's just the title of our of the presentation. And then there's going to be just a few introductory slides about how we're thinking about the problem. And the, the first issue is that you know, for any disease, we can prevent the disease, we can treat the disease, and we can cure the disease. HIV, of course, has been the most important disease of the 20th and now 21st century in terms of its magnitude and scope. And there have been terrific advancements in treatment. And so I can't say enough in the context of the conversation about the importance of treatment, and I'll come back to that again. And that requires testing and detection and linkage to care and ultimately um, suppression of, of, of the virus so that people can live a normal lifespan and uh, no longer be contagious. So treatment is really important. But even with treatment, um, we still see very substantial number of new cases every year, and we have uh, millions of people already infected worldwide. And the map in the first slide just tells you what you already know, that this is kind of uh, at different epidemics in different places uh, related to different uh, modes of transmission. And in the United States and Europe, a men of sex with men represents the dominant uh, type of acquisition of HIV. In Eastern Europe uh, inter and Vietnam, intravenous drug use persists as a really important um, source of HIV infection. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the infection is mostly sexually transmitted among heterosexual couples, um, where one person doesn't know their status and isn't treated, and the other person then becomes at risk. Um, and, and as everyone on this call knows, the spread of the disease has been um, greatest in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it continues to be a really big problem. And if we go to the next slide, in the next couple of slides, we'll just um, indicate how we understand the spread of HIV. We understand that the spread from one person to the other or the maintenance of an epidemic depends on how easy it is to, for the virus to go from one person to another. Um, and that e the ease with which it can go from one person to another changes based on a lot of variables. Um, and the reason the epidemic is so sustained is because once somebody becomes infected, they become contagious for very long periods of time unless they're treated. And this is different than other infectious diseases. For example, the influenza uh, or many other viral diseases, the virus is acquired, the person is sick, and as the person gets well, the virus is no longer available for spread, whereas in HIV, a person remains fairly healthy for very long periods of time with a very long duration of infectiousness unless, we, unless the person's <coughs> status is recognized and they're treated. And then the number of people exposed depends on the number of sexual contacts. And while we would prefer everyone to be monogamous and be in a single partner relationship, that just doesn't happen uh, worldwide, um, you know, in terms of how people maintain their relationships and sex lives. And so the number of people exposed can be substantial um, over a long period of time. So for prevention of HIV, for prevention, everything we do is designed to either reduce the ease, the efficiency, the ease with which HIV goes from one person to another to reduce the time that a person who's infected remains infectious and to reduce the number of people exposed. So those are, those are all the available strategies. And the next slide, um, the next graphic talks about everything we've done to try and prevent HIV, and it's divided into panels. And on the far left panel, we talk about taking somebody who's HIV negative and helping them in any possible way to remain negative, the most important tool available, for example, are condoms. Um, and we can also treat STDs to reduce HIV acquisition based on inflammation. It reduces the ease with which the virus can go from one person to another. And most importantly, we try and keep people in, as much as possible in monogamous relationships where 
two negative people will remain negative if they're in a monogamous relationship. So on the far left is, is keeping HIV negative people negative. On the far right is probably the most important tool that's been developed to date, and that is just the simple idea of finding people and treating them, because the treated person is far less contagious. As long as the virus is suppressed, transmission of HIV becomes very, very unlikely, close to zero. So suppressing the virus is important, and, and for a person's individual health, it's pretty clear <clears throat> that early detection of HIV will lead to a situation where people will live a normal lifespan, a healthy normal lifespan with one pill a day. So getting rid of the stigma associated with HIV infection, getting uh, routinizing um, detection and treatment as early as possible, those are our big strategies today. Um, but we're going to talk in much more detail about things in the middle panel, which is that in the end of the day, to really deal with HIV, we need a vaccine. And in the end of the day, there are other biological tools that are available, such as antiviral agents for the negative person, referred to as pre-exposure prophylaxis. Those can be used orally or topically, and I'll come back to that in more detail. And then there's the development of a whole new tool that we're going to talk about this morning, and that is the use of antibodies to prevent HIV acquisition. And we're going to refer to these antibodies as broad neutralizing antibodies, abbreviated on all the slides as BNABs broad neutralizing antibodies. So this is kind of the topic of our discussion this morning. If we go to the next slide, we see that for the, the treatment of infected people, we have this 90-90-90 program, which is believed to be the cent which is the central prevention strategy right now, of finding 90% of the infected people and treating 90% and, and linking 90% to care, and then suppressing virus to 90% through the appropriate treatment. And as I've already said, this is a great idea but it's simply not enough, and we're trying to develop other biological tools. And if we go back to the same slide I already showed you, uh, the four panels, um, and we look go to the middle panels of the slide, again, we see this emphasis on we've, what we've done is we've done everything possible to prevent an HIV-negative person from being exposed. But at the moment of exposure, if there's a biological tool that can prevent the acquisition of HIV, we should use that biological tool. The most important biological tool for any infection, to prevent any infection, is a vaccine. So for most of the people on the phone, they've, they've been vaccinated so that at the moment of exposure of influenza, for example, if there's influenza antibodies available, H influenza will not be acquired. For chickenpox, if we've given somebody the chickenpox vaccine, at the moment of exposure, chickenpox will not occur, but likewise because of antibody formation. If, if we measles, mumps, rubella have been very widely used, polio has been very widely used, and each of these vaccines is assuming that at a moment in time, exposure to a virus will occur, and the vaccine will prevent the infection by binding the virus before it can cause infection. Um, and this theme is going to come up for us again and again. So the holy grail, the most important thing we could do in HIV prevention is to make a vaccine but we do not have a vaccine. So be, because we don't have a vaccine, there's another strategy that's been developed, and an important strategy. And that strategy is, why don't we use the pills we use for treatment and give those pills to HIV-negative people who are at high risk and ask them to take a pill a day every day. And if they take a pill a day every day, um, at the moment of exposure, the tissues will be bathed in antiviral agents, the same, these antivirals that can kill the HIV virus, so there's no vaccine, but there's the agent available, and the antiviral agent would, would prevent the tissue from growing HIV. And so this has been referred to as antiretroviral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the, if we go to the next slide, one drug combination has been approved as a pill for antiretroviral prophylaxis, and that's the combination of tenofovir and FTC, and that's called, the trade name for that is Truvada. That was approved in 2012 for men and women who at highest risk would take a pill every day to prevent HIV acquisition. And, and the good news is this strategy can work for people who take, can take a pill every day um, for some period of time. But as I'm going to show you in the next slide, the relationship between the success of this strategy and the pills has a lot to do with how often you take the pills. So this kind of next slide, if you have the slides, it's this line showing on the far right, it's showing 
very good effectiveness prevention in men and women when the pills are taken every day. But you see, if, as the line goes to the left, reduced effectiveness, that reflects people who did not take pills as often. And it, and it probably turns out that, that the pills have a different kind of forgiveness in men and women. If men take these pills every day, if men miss a few pills, they're probably still protected. But if women miss taking these pills, the protection probably is lost. So this kind of everyday pill taking is, is an important, uh, is, is important both, if you're infected, it's important to reduce the viral growth. And if you're not infected and you're taking pills for prevention, it's really important to prevent the HIV acquisition. So we have this one prevention tool that's not a vaccine called pre-exposure prophylaxis, but we still need to worry about vaccines, as I've said over and over and over again. So the alternative then, the alternative to this pill taking would be some sort of an injection or an infusion that would last longer than one day, that would last weeks or months. And so the person who gets this injection or an infusion does not need to worry about or has less worry about getting HIV infection. So along those lines, what you're going to hear about, not in this call, but in the future, are injectable antiretroviral agents. So this is the same idea as the treatment agents now made into a shot, and the shots can last 8 to 12 weeks. And those shots might be used for treatment, but they could also be used for prevention. And the HP10 is also trying to develop injectable antiretroviral agents for prevention. And this is very much like a woman taking birth control. A woman might take pills, but some women would forget the pill. So they'd say, I don't want to take a pill. I'm going to take a shot every two or three months, and that shot will prevent me from getting pregnant. That's the same theory behind developing injectable antiretroviral agents. But that's not the topic for today. The topic for today is not an, in, not an injection into the muscle, but the infusion of an antibody. And so we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about the, the issues about the infusion of an antibody. And the, that requires, like, kind of thinking about the issue of what it means, this infusion of an antibody. And the study we're going to talk about related to these antibody, this antibody is going to be called HBTN703, HBTN081, representing a partnership between the Prevention Trials Network and the, and the Vaccine Network uh, in developing this strategy. So now I need to really slow down because the most important concept of our discussion this morning is on this slide, and it has to do with antibody-mediated immunity. So uh, how could antibodies, how, how, does, how do we think about this? And there's two concepts that are important. The first concept is the concept of active immunity. And active immunity, active immunity is created when scientists have been able to understand how you can take a virus or something like a virus and put it in the arm and induce cells of the body to come forward, recognize the thing in the arm, and these cells are called B cells, and they're being asked to start making antibodies. And if they recognize the thing that's been put in the arm and they start making antibodies, they make sufficient antibodies to prevent infection. And we refer to this as active immunity. And the thing we put in the arm is called an immunogen. And the cells that make antibodies are called B cells. And everyone on the phone has had a vaccine. And when they got a vaccine, that vaccine was put in the arm or put in the, the buttocks in order to form active immunity. So polio vaccine polio antibodies were made, influenza vaccine, influenza antibodies were made, measles, mumps, rubella, antibodies were made against those three agents, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. And in each case, the antibody concentration in the blood is sufficient to prevent infection over some period of time. And, and in different cases, the duration of protection lasts different periods of time. For, for measles, mumps, and rubella, those, those, those injections last at least 10 years or more. Um, for polio, probably it's, it's longer than 10, 10 years. So um, the, the immunogen will stimulate the concentration of antibody necessary for years and years and years just from that single shot. Now, in the case of influenza, we give shots every year because a different virus has to be prevented every year. Um, now, just talking about these other infections, measles, mumps, and rubella, and, and infections like that, they, when, when a person doesn't have a vaccine and, get, and they get the infection, the antibodies they make and the defenses that they mount, they make the infection go away. And the reason they make the infection go away is because the virus, as it multiplies, doesn't change. 
Now, an important idea here is with HIV, when the HIV virus is acquired, as the antibodies are generated against the natural infection of HIV, the virus keeps changing and changing and changing. And by changing and changing and changing, it outsmarts the antibodies. And I'll talk about this in more detail in a few minutes. Okay, so in summary, active immunity, everyone on the phone has active immunity against one or more things that as a child they were giving a shot to prevent infection. What's passive immunity? It's a, it's a slightly different idea. Passive immunity is like this. If we know or think we know which antibodies can prevent infection, we can take the antibodies and infuse the antibodies into the blood at a concentration that we believe will prevent infection. And the passive immunity, the antibodies infused into the blood and passive immunity can last several months. So if we see a person who's been exposed to hepatitis B, uh, we can take, we have antibodies already made in the emergency room, in the hospital. And somebody comes in and says, I've been exposed to hepatitis B. We can take those antibodies and infuse them into the blood to prevent a person from getting hepatitis B. If you're bitten by a rabid dog, uh, we have antibodies that we've made against rabies, uh, and we take those antibodies and we infuse them either into the blood or into the tissue right where the bite is. And we're doing that so that the antibodies can grab the rabies virus before the rabies virus can cause fatal infection. So passive immunity is different than active immunity. And passive immunity depends on infusing antibodies that we think work or believe might work to prevent infection into the bloodstream. Our discussion today is really going to be about passive immunity. So the next slide talks about the race between HIV virus and antibodies. So now I need to go very slow, slow down a lot, and explain this as well. So here, when somebody gets HIV infection, it multiplies in the tissue, and then ultimately, if this is now the natural infection, it's multiplying the tissue, the cells are trying to fight it off. B cells come along and they start making antibodies. And they make, and when somebody gets an infection, they get infected with one virus, which is multiplying very fast. And the virus is recognized by the B cells. And the B cells make antibodies. And those antibodies become, are the basis of the test to prove somebody has HIV infection or does not have HIV infection. So that, that's what happens when somebody gets infected. But in HIV infection, the antibodies that are made against the virus that was acquired cannot cannot stop the infection. And the reason they cannot stop the infection is because the virus keeps changing. So every cycle or so of replication, every time it multiplies, it multiplies in a way where the, the next virus is not the same as the first virus, and the third virus is not the same as the second virus. And so the HIV-infected person ends up with, with dozens and dozens and dozens of different viruses in their bloodstream. They're all HIV, but each one's a little bit different. The, the person's antibodies that are being generated, they keep generating antibodies, and each antibody is a little bit different, but none of them really work to prevent infection. Now, it turns out that a small number of people, maybe 10% of people with HIV, over many, many years, they start making what are called broad neutralizing antibodies. And these broad neutralizing antibodies, they can, they're, they're a special antibody that can kill multiple different strains, 80 or 90% of all the HIV positive strains. Those antibodies still cannot protect, can, cannot stop the infection in the person who's making the antibodies, but they're very broad, and they're, as I said, they're called broad neutralizing antibodies. Now, these broad, the, among the broad, there's a lot of different broad neutralizing antibodies. We're today focusing on one antibody that has been developed by the NIH called Vaccine Research Center, VRC, Vaccine Research Center Antibody 1. And this antibody blocks the place where the HIV virus binds. All HIV viruses must bind a place, and this antibody blocks that place. So the antibody that took years and years to find, um, and I won't go into the technology to find it, is, became a really important antibody. And what happened was once the antibody was made, once, once we saw the antibody, once the people of the NIH saw the antibody, they took the antibody, they made it into larger concentrations, and they, they did an experiment, and the experiment is shown on the next slide. Um, and in the experiment, what they're doing is they're saying, we have this antibody, and in a test tube, the antibody kills about 90% of all the HIV strains we can find. But that doesn't mean it would work in a, in a human or an animal. So the antibody then was 
given to monkeys, and then so in a con, in high concentration, so it's infused into the monkeys, and then the monkeys are challenged either in the vagina or the rectum with HIV, and when they're challenged, the question is, did that antibody that was infused in the blood prevent infection? And in each case, the antibody prevented infection, and that's kind of shown in the next slide where the antibody, the animals that don't get an antibody get infection 100% of the time eventually, and the antibodies that the animals that did get antibody were completely protected from the viruses that were used. So we refer to all this as biological plausibility. It suggests that there's these antibodies that some people make, that, and one of them is, can be generated, and in a test tube that, one, that antibody can kill 90% of the strains of HIV, and in an animal, that antibody can prevent the acquisition of the HIV virus. So all of that suggests, whoa, this antibody might prevent HIV infection in humans. So this would be an alternative kind of pre-exposure prophylaxis. If the, just like I talked about the antiviral agent Truvada, that's an age of pill you take every day. Well, these antibodies, if infused, they last about eight to ten weeks. So at eight week, for eight weeks, you might get protection from HIV acquisition. So the next slide just says the big question that the non-human primate, NHP, the non-human primate, the, the monkey study, suggests that antibodies at achievable levels prevent an infection. So in humans, can these antibodies prevent infection? And, and equally important, how much antibody is required to prevent infection? So those are the big questions about passive immunity with these antibodies. So it brings us to a critical moment in time. And it, about broad neutralizing antibodies. Well, what's the way forward? How do you, how, what, what should scientists do to, to move this forward if, if they're going to move it forward at all? Well, the first issue is it's safe. Because if, if you take an HIV negative person and you do anything that's not safe, it's unacceptable. So the number one question is, are these antibodies safe? And in general, monoclonal antibodies have been used now for 10 or 15 years. There are a lot of them, and they've proven very safe. But this antibody needs to be proven safe. And the second is, can this antibody prevent infection, and how well can it prevent infection? So those are two big questions. So the first study that, that's already been completed now is called HVTN, HIV Vaccine Trials Network 104, and that's shown on the next slide. And HVTN Trial 104 um, took healthy subjects and gave them antibodies um, to, to prove that it was safe. And so far to date, the antibodies have caused no serious side effects. Now, it's a small number of subjects, not hundreds of subjects, but dozens of subjects. So no, no big side effects. And another important issue that would come up, I think, for, for a person participating in a trial is, do the antibodies cause you to look like you're HIV infected? And the answer is no. These antibodies are not the same antibodies that are measured in an HIV positive or negative test. So we have no reason to believe that these antibodies can make anybody appear HIV positive. And furthermore, they go away in eight weeks. So even if you did appear HIV positive, the antibodies should be gone uh, in eight weeks. But so far, there's been no, no, no evidence that these could ever make you look HIV positive, and they've proven very safe. So because they prove safe, that brings us to a moment in time where we have to say, are we going to prove that these can prevent infections in humans. And, and there's two really big reasons we would want to do that. First, to develop a new product, a choice of a product like an infusible, infusion, infusion agent that could prevent HIV. Now, you might say, somebody might say, well, look, no one's going to really want to every eight weeks sit down and get an infusion, but these antibodies can be changed even further, so they could potentially be delivered every six months or every year. And there are other ways to do this other than just infusing them. But the main issue is, first, we have to prove that, they're, that they work. The second issue is, if we know how much antibody it takes to prevent infection, it will inform us whether we could ever make a vaccine. If we know if a low concentration of these antibodies prevents infection, it becomes a real race to develop a vaccine that makes this antibody. So two really big um, possibilities in this trial. So because the drug appears safe and because there are two giant questions to answer, a trial has been developed. And the first trial, well, the, and, and the trial is HVTN703, HVTN081. We refer to this as a phase 2B trial to determine if intravenous administration of VRC1 prevents HIV infection. And that, that's the slide in front of you now, I hope, slide number 17. 
And the, the study groups that would participate, that we would hope would participate in the trial are two different groups. Uh, one, the first group, men who have sex with men in the Americas and transgender women in the Americas who are at high risk of HIV acquisition. And the second group would be women in um, sub-Saharan Africa um, who are at high risk by virtue of living in these communities, in, in communities where HIV acquisition has remained very, very common. Um, for the men, the background HIV acquisition is probably between 3 and 4 percent. And for the women, the background HIV acquisition, the chance of getting HIV in a year is probably between 5 and 8 percent in some communities in sub-Saharan Africa. So these are really, really high-risk people in whom we hope a tool, this tool, <coughs> can prove effective. Now, if we go to the next slide, again, this is a really important slide because it shows the study design. And the study design um, is divided up into men and women, um, and I've already emphasized that. And it shows that there are really that there are three there are three groups in the study. The first group is a placebo group. We have no idea if this stuff works. So some group will get an infusion of saline if, because we have no idea if, it, if, the, if the material will work at all. We hope it works. We have no idea. The second group gets an infusion of 10 milligrams um, uh, per kilogram of the antibody. Um, it takes about an hour to get this infusion, an hour and a half to an hour, and they get the infusion of the antibody, and that's called the, that's the low dose group. And the second group, the third group, I'm sorry, the third group gets a 30 milligram dose of the antibody, and that, and and so you'd say, well, why are we using two doses of the antibody? Well, because we need we want to be able to identify the lowest possible dose of antibody that can prevent infection. Because the lower the concentration of antibody required to prevent infection, the better the chance we can develop a vaccine or an infusion product. So three groups, a, a, a placebo group gets getting saline, uh, a group that gets uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram of antibody, and a group that gets 30 milligrams per kilogram of antibody. Now, the study is about to start first in men, and more men are going to be enrolled than women, 2,600 men in the Americas. Um, why, why more men than women? Because the size of the popul the size of the group to be tested depends on the frequency that you expect HIV. So men are at lower risk in general than women, and so a bigger number of subjects is necessary to prove that the drug works. For women, we estimate that 1,300 women in Sub-Saharan Africa would be enough study subjects in the three groups to prove that the drug works. Um, now, the objectives of infusing the drug, I'll say again, the number one objective is to further prove that it's safe. So safety is of paramount importance. So every person who gets the vaccine, uh, the, uh, immune, the uh, antibody, every person that gets the broad neutralizing VRCO1 antibody, they have to be monitored carefully for any side effects while they're in the clinic and when they leave the clinic. They're coming every month and will be monitored for side effects. Um, and the second issue will be to prove that HIV is being prevented by the antibody. And then the third issue is if HIV is occurring, we can take the virus that occurred and very quickly understand how the infection occurred. Did it occur because the antibody didn't work or was too low concentration or that the virus is resistant to that antibody? So we have the science to do, to understand every infection that occurs almost in real time. So the subjects who participate in the study are expected to get 10 infusions. Um, infusions every eight weeks, as I've indicated, but with monthly visits. So it's a very intensive study, and so subjects who participate are going to have to really want to participate because it's so intensive in terms of all the uh, requirements for the study to succeed. Um, this study has already been approved by the um, Internal Data Safety Monitoring Board and is before the U.S. FDA for approval. It's already been reviewed by the South African uh, regulatory agency, and some questions are being answered for that agency. So, and it's already been approved by 10 different IRBs. So a lot has already happened to get ready for the study. Now, um, and, and I've kind of tried to outline up to this point the rationale for the study and the design of the study and the number of subjects who have to participate. But now I go to the next slide, which is a really important slide, and again, I have to slow down about this. Or two slides, I'm sorry. First, the next slide will be about the main hypotheses of the study, that we're going to reduce HIV acquisition with an agent that's going to prove safe, 
that the concentration of antibody in the serum is going to be directly related to prevention of HIV. When the concentration is greatest, HIV will prevent it best. As the, as the concentration is reduced, HIV uh, breakthrough might occur. And then any viruses that, that do break through the antibody will be explained. And they'll be explained either because there's not enough antibody or the virus is resistant. Now, the next slide is about the prevention package. So let me just, let's think about this for a second. We're asking study subjects to participate in a study where we have no idea if the, if the thing we're infusing offers any protection at all. That's why we're comparing the infusion to uh, saline, to, this, to water, or to something like water, so, so uh, to a placebo. But it's really our obligation, once the subject's in the trial, to do everything possible to prevent HIV infection for what we already know works. So we call this the prevention package. And, and all three groups have to be provided the same intensive prevention package. The prevention package has to include informed counseling, condoms, treatment of any STDs, which would increase the risk of HIV. And then the subjects have to be offered a Truvada uh, as allowed in each country. So it's a little bit different country by country what, what's going on with Truvada PrEP. Now, in the Americas, all the countries have the ability to have Truvada PrEP, and we're starting in the Americas, and so we have a strategy where somebody who comes in the study and wants to take Truvada PrEP can take Truvada PrEP for free for the duration of the study. Um, now, the prevention package must reduce HIV below what would otherwise be expected. So if we expect, like, 3 or 4 or 5 percent infection in men, let's say 3 to 4 percent, we would anticipate the prevention package will perhaps cut that incidence of HIV acquisition in half. If we expect 5 to 8 percent in women, we would anticipate that the prevention package alone might reduce infection to 4 percent, which would be a great thing to do. Now, as we've done the statistics and the size of the study, we've anticipated all the benefits of the prevention package. Um, and as we monitor the study, it, it, it's like this. If the prevention package works so well it makes HIV infection go away, just by itself, the, the control group, then, then the study would be what we call futile if the prevention package is perfect. What usually happens, happens is the study is designed so you can see a difference between the control group and the experimental group, even though both groups are getting the prevention, the benefits of the prevention package. Um, now, the prevention package can change during the course of the study. Suppose that there's other, this study is going to go on for two or three years, maybe longer. Suppose new discoveries are made in prevention that need to be applied to all the groups to prevent HIV infection. Well, that's the dynamics of the study. We'd have to introduce prevention, new prevention things across all the groups. And let's talk about, like, what could go wrong. Well, suppose the subject come for the first visit but never come for the second visit. Well, that would lead to futility. Suppose we can't enroll the subjects. Well, that would lead to futility. Futility means the study gets stopped. Now, the results of the study are completely blind to the investigators, but monitored by a safety board. Suppose the safety board sees that the group that gets the antibodies is having tremendous benefit, and the group that gets the placebo is getting infection. Well, the study would be stopped and declared a success earlier. So there's all kinds of stopping rules. That, there's all kinds of change rules and stopping rules that, that, take advantage, that are designed to maximize the protection of the subject and to do the shortest possible study possible to get the information we need of whether this uh, anti broad neutralizing antibody works. So the best case scenario, this, this is the last, next to last slide, the best case scenario. In the best case scenario, um, the study will be a success. Subjects will be enrolled and they'll be retained in the study, even though it's a very intensive study. And we will find that a low dose of antibody the 10 milligram dosage will provide substantial protection against HIV acquisition. If that's true, then two things can happen. First, let's make a vaccine against HIV that looks just like the broad neutralizing antibody. Second, let's make a product that can last more than eight weeks, that can last six months or a year, so we have it available for some people that it could be actually infused to prevent infection for very long periods of time. 
So this this is a very big, very complicated study, and um, in all in all honesty, you know, no one's done an antibody study this big before. So the two networks have gotten together with the support of the NIH and um, lots of different countries to get ready to do this study because of the importance of the questions. Um, the people on the phone just can only just can only go. Just can only go Oops, got like lines are being unmuted in preparation for questions. Okay, this can only work if if um, this can only work if if study subjects want to participate and if the study is conducted properly. <laughs> that can only happen if, if everybody in the communities understand why we're trying to do this, why we think it's important, and everybody is, is in the thinking in the same direction. So the purpose of this call and, and other calls like this will be to answer all the questions that might arise some of which we haven't anticipated. You know, every question that people might ask, saying, well, why are you doing this? How is it going to work? Is it going to work? And so on and so forth. So I really appreciate the uh, group on the phone today. This is the first of a lot of calls trying to understand all the questions and try and move this study forward that we think is of tremendous importance. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to thank all of you for this morning or this afternoon, if you're in Africa, for listening. And, and obviously I want to thank all the networks and the NIH for their support uh, of this uh, uh, study and this uh, discussion on the phone.